Shalom. I am Rabbi Josh Caruso from Anshe Chesed, Fairmount Temple. Honored to stand here with Cantor Misha Pisman from Park Synagogue, the community to which Steve and Molly belong. I am once again honored to walk with the family through this stage through this time in their lives. Let us do honor to a great man, a man we will hear about in just a few moments. In the words of Ecclesiastes, a season is set for everything, a time for every experience under heaven, a time for dancing, a time for wailing, a time for birthing, time for dying, a time for speaking, a time for silence, a time for seeking, a time for losing. The time of mourning is a complicated time filled with many emotions and memories, both bitter and sweet. We begin our service with the recitation of psalms and prayers, thus linking Steve's life with the 3,000-year-old tradition of the people Israel and the eternity of God. It was just chanted. I invite you now to join me in the English rendering of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> after a while, after a while, you learn the subtle difference between holding a hand and chaining a soul. And you learn that love doesn't mean leaning, and that company doesn't always mean security. And you learn that kisses aren't contracts and presents aren't promises. And you begin to accept your defeats with your head up and your eyes straight ahead, with the grace of a woman or a man, not the grief of a child. And you learn to build all your roads on today, because tomorrow's ground is too uncertain for plans, and futures have a way of falling down in mid-flight. 
after a while, you learn that even sunshine burns if you bask too much. So you plant your own garden, you decorate your own soul, instead of waiting for someone to bring you flowers. And you learn that you really can endure, and that you really are strong, and that you really have worth. And you learn, and you learn, with every goodbye, you learn. It seems so appropriate to raise up some Torah, some rabbinic literature for the man who knew a lot about Judaism himself. Al-Tifrosh min hatzibor. Do not separate yourself from the community. That was Steve. Steve did not separate himself from his Judaism, from his beloved state of Israel, from his beautiful family. He did not separate himself from his students. He was fully ensconced in the community. And wherever you found him, there was lots of life, lots of spirit, lots of inspiration. Whether you wanted it or not, he provided it. He was never standing in the corner separating from his community. He was front and center holding court, supporting his community, leading his community, speaking to his community, raising up his voice like a shofar to his community. He understood what it meant to stand proud, to stand firm for what you believe in. And whether or not you agreed with him, you had to have respect for him. Because he spoke his mind, he spoke his truth. He didn't separate from the community. And so today, his community does not separate from him. Today we come together and we give him a great amount of tribute and respect, kavod hamet, honoring our loved one, honoring this man who had such a big presence. We'll honor him with memories and testimonies and stories. And um, so we have a few speakers as well. We'd like to um, invite um, some members of the community who knew him, both family and friends. Um, I'd actually uh, first like to start with um, his brother, Michael. I uh, was rather Jack. I'm sorry. Jack is going to share some words on behalf of Rabbi Scoff, who um, could not be here, but um, clearly is thinking of the family now. And Jack, would you read some of his words? Molly and Steve deserve the award for the world's cutest couple. Whether at Shabbat services or occasionally bumping into them around Cleveland, they always had this great banter going on, a clever repartee. It was clear that they loved each other, and Stephen often took delight in telling how Molly had rejected him as a suitor years before. He could relish that story only because he had won her over in a later chapter of life, and it brought such great love to them both. They are both colorful personalities, a little funky, but the match worked. They discussed, they debated. She listened to his jokes, occasionally rolling her eyes. 
They were honest with each other. He would listen to her when she told him he was being too cranky. Sometimes they were an active couple. They wanted to be present and immersed in each other. They walked through life, which made them sweeter by being together. Don't know whether all of you have picked up on this through the years, but Steve could occasionally be a bit outspoken. <laughs> strong views, strong opinions, but a sincere heart, a good heart. And that voice, you could hear that thick, husky voice through a rainstorm. Steve Perry was a passionate man. The passions ran deep and ran far. He was dedicated and proud of his work in Jewish education, his work with kids and adults. He was proud to be a Zionist, proud to be a Jew. It is fitting and very meaningful that we are speaking of and memorializing Steve today on the same day that 18,000 supporters of Israel are gathering for Israel education and advocacy in Washington, D.C. at APAC. If Steve's spirit is strong in Cleveland today, then part of who he was and what he believed in <coughs> was in his determination to keep Zionism strong. His wonderful parents were longtime members of our community at Park Synagogue. He was loyal to his upbringing, sturdy, dedicated, and periodically loud with his siblings. <laughs> Dependable and reflective during both the joys and several sadnesses of family life, we at Park will miss him. Molly, he was a good man. invite Regina Oblinsky to join us to share some words from a unique perspective from non-family but certainly she feels like family. The following is a letter that I wrote and gave to Steve on October 29th about two weeks after his diagnosis. Molly asked me to read it today. Dear Steve, most people don't get to hear what others really think of them while they're alive. It is usually only at their funerals that those closest to them say a few words about their time together, share a meaningful memory, or offer words of comfort to the bereaved among them. But you, my friend, are not usual in any way. This is why I connect with you so well and love you so much. You came into our life over 11 years ago through our beloved Kol Hadash. You were brash and loud, but also underneath all that bravado, warm, loving, and kind. I have heard it said about you that people either loved you or hated you. You didn't evoke feelings of meh from anyone. I, for one, have always loved you. Maybe because we just understood each other, our sense of humor, critical thinking, passionate way of being or maybe because you were a badass, and I love that about you. My Emily took to you unlike anything I had ever seen. She wanted to be with you, listen to you, learn from you. She picked you to be her godfather when the thought of giving her one had never occurred to me. So from the time that she was about eight, that was what you were. You and Molly honored us so much by standing up for Emily with an aliyah and Molly as one of her four mothers at her bat mitzvah. I will never forget how much love I felt from you both on that day. Your gift of the handmade kippot was exquisite. You continued to talk with Emily and listen to her, especially during the past year and a half when our world turned upside down. You blessed our new home by putting up the mezuzot and allowed Emily to voice her disbelief in God and religion without judgment. You passed along your love of JFK to her and then gifted her with so many of your precious books and mementos of him. 
You welcomed us into your home for Shabbat dinners and Passover seders and joined us in ours. We became family. You called me your sister, something you never had. Sometimes it is our chosen family that gives us the love, understanding, and connection we've always needed. Thank you for becoming an internet ordained minister, just in case that opportunity presented itself to marry someone close to you. I'm sorry that it didn't, but rest assured that when that day comes, you will be there with me. Feel free to give me words of wisdom and grill Ray on his worthiness. I know that this matters to you. I will be sure to pass the lessons on to Emily when it is her time. Thank you for giving me your number one coach pendant. I don't have a memory of you that doesn't have you wearing it. I now wear it with pride and love and feel incredibly honored that you chose me for this gift. I thank God every day for blessing me with your love and friendship and letting me feel that sense of acceptance and belonging. I will cherish your memory and our times together. I promise to live my life with the love of Judaism in Israel as well as a sense of righteousness that you have always had. With love and friendship forever, Regina. Sis. You might notice that there's a theme of Steve adopting <laughs> people who were not blood related to him but became family. The same is true for Yaron and Mirit Balkin. Yaron's going to share some words on behalf of uh, the family. This is a letter from my wife. I'm writing to you, Steve, from APAC. It's my first time here. I seriously thought of canceling my trip so I could properly say goodbye to you, but I thought about it, and I know that you, from all people, would probably be the first one to say that I should go anyway, and would probably say that you want to come too, and I'll see if I can fit you in my luggage. <laughs> like, every time, like every time I told you about any trip to Israel. I want to share with everyone that came uh, to say the last, the last goodbye to you who you were to us. You were first and, and foremost Steve, Saba Steve, Grandpa Steve. From the first time we met and were the ultimate, uh, you were the ultimate Saba for our kids. You were everything a Saba should and could be, tickling, giggling, and being silly with them. So much so that sometimes Molly had to put you in a timeout. I kept telling you that you are the best version they could ever get for a Saba. Watching Sammy the Squirrel with them and preparing your famous cinnamon French toast especially for them. You introduced Ori to Battle Sheep and you never let him win unless he earned it. <laughs> you were there when the kids needed a shoulder. You were there to celebrate an achievement in school or graduation of animal shelter, shelter camp, watching a dog cat show even though you were allergic to cats. Your, your perfect combo of silliness together with your endless love to Israel and your Jewish Cleveland mentality always made us feel so much at home and it's, and it's the kind of home we ourselves never had. We left Israel behind, behind and found it in you with your IDF uniform, stories about your mefaked, your commander in Israel at the 67 war. We learned very quickly to skip our opinions about Israel because you believed it was perfect. Uh, we celebrated six beautiful Thanksgivings together. We made it a habit to meet on Memorial Day and Rosh Hashanah. And don't forget Passover. You brought us into your setter table and opened a whole wide world of story and tradition being told from the horse's mouth, sus, <laughs> horse in Hebrew. For those who never had the privilege to hear about sus, I will say sus is the horse Moses had, a hand puppet during the, uh, during the year that came to life around the setter table telling the story of the Haggadah, making sure all the setter participants are altered, are alerted and engaged. You really had a unique way of filling up the mitzvah of Vigadet Alibanecha, the mitzvah of sharing the story of the Israelites' journey from Egypt to Israel to the young generation. You have already, to, I have already told you recently <coughs> that, we will pick, that we will keep a good eye on Sus now that you are gone, and I promise you 
that through him we will make sure that you are an integral life, inter you are an integral life part of our family center every year. Whether they were the only kids or with other, our kids never felt less than your grandkids, and I can hope that they that, and I can hope is that uh, they made you feel no less than the best Saba. <clears throat> but you weren't just a Saba. You kept calling me Mirit Yakirati, Mirit my de my dearest. You were there when I was sick, checking how I am I doing and. What did the doctor say, driving me to chemo or just passing by to eat lunch with me? You held my hand while I was on my cancer journey. And whenever you saw me down or gloomy, you would say, I wish I could take cancer f away from you and take it upon me to be sick instead of you. How ironic it is that you probably had your cancer by then and we just didn't know yet. I could go on and on about memories and funny little uh, anecdotes, but I think that the way I had the privilege of saying goodbye to you would describe best who you were, at least in my eyes. You were already very sick in the hospice and it was the first night that they told us in the hospice it's a matter of hours. At that point, I took the warning very seriously only to learn later that they don't really know you. You kept fighting until the last minute and it ended up not being not it ended up being not just hours, but weeks until you decided that it is time to go, that it was time to go. But that night, I didn't know better yet, and so I came to visit you thinking it's a matter of hours. The nurse said that they believe you can probably still hear us, but you were out of, uh, but you were out of conscious at this point. It was Friday night, and I was on my way to grab the food for, the, for Molly, thinking I would drop by and say goodbye for a few minutes and, go and move on. But I couldn't leave. I couldn't leave you there alone. I thought what I can do to help you gracefully. I asked myself, what would you want to do if you were awake? Knowing that these are the last hours. Music, I thought. You would want to hear music, but which music? So I started with Steve Perry's Don't Stop Believing. You were always so proud that you and him sh shared the same name. You didn't respond. Then I thought something that will remind you of your beloved Israel. So I played Yerushalayim Shel Zav by Naomi Shemer. Still no response. Then I decided this is really bad. Let's read Tehillim, Psalms. So I opened Tehillim and read all your letters and some other prayers from Tehillim. You were still very quiet. I held your hand and I told you I would love, and I told you I love you. I thank you for everything that you did. Uh, for me and for us. I ask you to squeeze my hand if you hear me. Did you squeeze? And then I promise you we will take the best care of Molly. Squeeze my hand if you hear me or nod your head or anything. And then I waited. I thought about all the things we were still supposed to do together and how unfair this whole thing is. When I was sick, you came to visit me many times for lunch and you would bring, and you would bring uh, things from Hot Sauce Williams. I couldn't, I couldn't join your messy lunch. I was too sick to eat, but you told me that there is a punch card, uh, that the 10th meal is free. You said that you are basically earning the last meal for me, but you never got the 10th tenth, the tenth meals. And now there are only a few more hours left. And then I said goodbye. I looked back one more time and I was sure this is it. The next morning you woke up you, and you said that you were hungry. It was 11.15 a.m. I asked Molly, is he ready for lunch? And she said yes. I immediately went to Hot Sauce Williams and brought you, and brought you your favorite dish, sorry guys, shrimps, <laughs> together with coleslaw, french fries, and extra sauce on the side. I told the lady in the store, this dish goes to someone's last meal. She almost fainted. <laughs> I knew if you were there with me, you'd say we should make sure they punch the card. <laughs> because you are getting closer to earning my meal. It was the meal for her. I brought the food to the hospice and you enjoyed it so much. I asked you if you remember anything from last night and you said, nope. I told you, you were, I was reading Taylin for you last night and now you are eating this shrimp. <laughs> you, told Molly, you told Molly, make sure you put a rubber band on the little sauce container and then you looked at, at both and smiled. I already know what I'm, what I'm gonna have for dinner. I don't know if you did eat more of that food later that evening, but I am happy I had the privilege of having this last meal with you. Lito, Steve, I love you. 
We love you and we shall meet again. Thank you, Yaron. There are many people in Washington, D.C. at the APAC conference who are thinking of Steve right now. Yeah, <laughs> Steve is there, right? Yeah. Um, certainly in spirit, uh, for sure. Steve, indeed, was an Ohev Yisrael. He was a lover of Israel. He began his love affair with Israel when he was a teenager, wishing he could join the army. A handful of years ago, his lifelong dream came true. He got to spend three days on an IDF base by invitation of a colonel who he had previously met. He donned the uniform, shared meals with the soldiers, trained with them, and refused, refused spiffier accommodations because he wanted the full experience. And when Hatikva played, Steve wept tears alongside his fatigued comrades, knowing full well the Jewish story of the last 2,000 years and feeling as he himself had fought in the War of Independence. But that wasn't sufficient for Steve. Just about everything he found valuable in his own life he wished to share with others, to share his passion, to spread the word. It was too good to keep to himself. That was the case with sharing the real story about Israel with folks at home. He talked to the teachers at Orange, shared the story about Israel he knew so they could teach its history from a more informed point of view. Steve got them so charged up about Israel that they wanted to travel there and learn about it more firsthand. But Steve's Jewish pride was not relegated to Zionism. In fact, after his undergrad work at Case Western Reserve, Steve was admitted to the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion to pursue rabbinical ordination. His time at HUC proved to be dis disappointing, though, and he decided to leave the school. That, however, never stopped him from being everybody else's rabbi. If the term rabbi literally means teacher, then Steve was a rabbi figure to so many, and so many would concur that Steve would have made an inspiring rabbi. He officiated at friends' weddings, led services, delivered sermons on cruises, taught scores of students, and most importantly, he modeled the life of a teacher. Lainey Skelly remembers Steve fondly. She wrote, Steve was invested in my personal success in a way no one I ever invested in someone else, in, in a way, in no, in a way no one I ever, inve ever knew invested in someone else's kid. She writes, he encouraged me to have high standards for myself and to truly believe that my life could be whatever I wanted it to be and that my dreams were worth working for. I think he had this impact on a lot of youth. She writes, he had, um, um, a friend of mine had Steve as a sub in high school and he said that he had such a huge influence. I bet if you went around and asked a lot of kids who had Steve play a part in their lives, they would all say basically the same thing. He knew how to connect with kids. He connected with me and I will forever be grateful. Steve always seemed so interested in my opinion and gave my opinions value. I will forever be grateful for the time he was part of my life. Yes, he taught history and Jewish studies at Akiva and always with the strategic goal that his charges would enter college, not only feeling pride in their Judaism, but that they would be able to explain and defend their faith and love for the state of Israel. Steve believed that Jews of all ages, all of us, should be ambassadors of Judaism. He was raised in the Harvard Lee section of Cleveland. He attended Gracemont Elementary School and raised at 15515 Glendale. Steve was the loving sibling of Michael, who in some respects was raised by the older brothers, Jack, and the object of his most competitive impulses, his twin brother, Norton, or Norty, although all the brothers would certainly push each other. There was competition and fitful exchanges, which, um, which often, as Jack explains, would find Steve complaining about something as a teenager. 
Once, when everything for dinner was just perfect, everyone at the table was waiting for Steve to gripe about just something. So after a long pause, he searched his mind and he revealed that the ice cubes were too small. <laughs> there was a seriousness that Steve also took on as a kid because he really saw himself as one day perhaps becoming the president of the United States of America. And that is truth. So he had to carry himself as such, which is kind of ironic because of the playful, silly guy he could also be. To be sure, everything to see Steve was a game. He hated to lose. And yet Nordy was the ultimate arch nemesis. Nordy was the doer, Steve was the plotter. Each would deny complicity, usually blaming the other. They competed at everything, notably a track in high school, and later in life, their competitive natures veered into the most unexpected and disturbing territory when Steve set himself the challenge to live just that much longer than Norty did from the time he was diagnosed with cancer. No doubt, Steve was hard-headed. Jack remembers playing pinochle with his brothers and their dad, Oscar. For a time, they were playing three to four nights a week. And while their dad was a master instructor, Steve refused to give up on the hands he had early enough as he had should because he was convinced he could win with what he had. Even with all the posturing and gamesmanship, there was a special closeness between the boys and their dad. For Father's Day weekend in 2001, they all came from various points of origin to meet in Pittsburgh. And of course, to watch the Indians, of course they played Pinochle in the hotel. Sometime during the weekend, the boys recalled how much their dad loved the song, if I were a rich man. Oscar then told his sons that he is a rich man because he has them. It was a big deal when Steve's family moved to Cleveland Heights and the coaches at Heights High would challenge the city kid to prove himself in track. Steve, of course, ably met the challenge. He continued to run track at Case and his coach there remembers just how much his student impacted him. Well, Steve courted Molly at the ripe old age, or young, of 15 years old. They had met around Rosh Hashanah while he was now living in Cleveland Heights. Steve asked her to homecoming, but Molly's family lived in that old neighborhood in Harvard and Lee. So as a result, Steve's father went to pick her up um, for his son's date. <laughs> Molly, who was terribly shy at this juncture in her life, was taken with Steve, but also not ready to entertain a courtship. Nevertheless, the memory of that night stayed with Molly. She still has the corsage from that evening. And she wrote in her diary, my life has changed today. Two years later, Steve tried again, and Molly turned him down. They each went their separate ways, marrying and bringing children into this world, Allie, JJ, David, and Kelly. But each suffered heartache. Steve lost his wife eventually his son, Molly, would lose Kelly at a very young age. Steve languished after the death of his wife, Marlene, not knowing, and I think his friends and family wondered if he would ever truly be able to recover. But 33 years later, after Steve was widowed, 33 years after those failed dates in high school, after Steve was widowed, after Molly's marriage ended in divorce, the two are reunited. In what could only be likened to a When Harry Met Sally scenario, actually the romantic comedy served as the theme for their 10th anniversary, Steve got a second chance, and then a third chance, to be with his Beshert, his fated one. Those high school years with Molly stuck with him, and he even remembered what she was wearing that second time he asked her out. In 1994, upon hearing that Molly had divorced, Steve promptly left a message on her machine saying, Hello, I'm a voice from your distant past. <laughs> Let's have coffee. Molly, unpracticed at the dating life, but remembering him, got pointers from her friends. It turned out, though, that the two didn't need much help as they talked and talked and talked. And they walked some more and they talked some more. They didn't want that evening to end. And it really didn't end because the next night they went out again. 
They jitterbugged like they were teens. Molly enjoyed that dancing, got Steve to do it too. And their impending couplehood was famously predicted by Steve's mother when she met Molly and she wrote, It's Beshert! Indeed it was. Steve and Molly cooked together, traveled together, loved together, with both knowing that they were gifted with, another, with, with each other for a second chance at love. Molly even brought Steve to school with him sometimes, and the kids loved him. My own boys, Lev and Asher, remember him visiting class at Schechter. And he loved those kids. He took pride in his students, felt an obligation to guide them in their development. Unlike the stereotype of the disinterested substitute teacher, Steve was anything but. When he subbed, he regarded it as an opportunity to save the world and to shape young minds and to be a mentor and sympathetic ear for a confused or struggling student. He believed in paying it forward, hoping that his charges would serve as mentors too. Take his lead. Steve did not shy away from provocation and challenge when it was due though. He believed in that Jewish concept of tochacha, of benevolent agitation, of benevolent rebuke. He would challenge a kid who was goofing off, not only with the standard reprimand, but with the sincerity of a father who was concerned for his child. He would say, I see something in you. Then he would follow with the caution that if things continued as they were, he would be sad to see that very same student working at a fast food joint when they had so much more capacity. Take a look at Steve's Facebook page and you will find loads of students who not only count him as their former teacher and their mentor, but their friend. His connection to young people wasn't relegated to high school students either. He was really just a kid in a grown-up's body. He loved children and seemed to recalibrate his interpersonal skills to match the age of the kid. Michael acknowledged that his brother could relate to just about everyone. He just fit in. Mostly, though, he loved being with his grandchildren and his nieces and his nephews, who he treated as his grandchildren. No question about it. He loved them so, adored them. And he was fun-loving. He was a playful bear, often raising his claw to have fun with them, to scare them sillily. And they could enjoy every time he visited and look forward to Pop Pop. I was able to, um, through Allie, to get some words from his grandchildren in Philadelphia. Robbie talked about how crazy he was, how he would talk to and name his plants and pet squirrels. I've heard a lot about his squirrels, Molly. Rocky and Adrian. Robbie spent a few weeks one summer with Steve and Molly, which left a big impression on him. They took him to a swim club where he got over his fear of heights, to garage sales, and on a boat where he went boogie boarding. Maddie talked about the special time he had with his papa while preparing for his bar mitzvah, but especially on the day before the bar mitzvah when Steve took him to get a cheesesteak. He was wearing a neon shirt, pants, hat, and shoes. That's the memory of Maddie. So when they walked into the cheesesteak place, which was appropriately called Steve's Prince of Steaks, they announced, oh, we have a tourist here. <laughs> I didn't realize there was so much trafe in this funeral service. <laughs> Natalie, talked, Natalie talked about whenever they would visit or they would visit them, how she would jump on the bed to wake them up, wake them up. From the day Natalie was born, Steve called her his sweetness. So when she was older, to remind her to be nice, he would call her mean girl, to which she would respond, no, I am your sweetness. Natalie loved when he came to her Maccabee soccer games. She called him her sideline coach. Go figure, right, Allie writes? <laughs> and then something about Steve's grand pig. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but she does. Some common themes all three talked about was how he taught them all to play poker and how they looked forward to their games whenever they would see each other. 
Another was how they would play a game they liked to call Niagara Falls, step by step, inch by inch, and he would chase after them. He would also give them gold dollars and how happy they were that he finally received his dipping sauce for his pizza. He liked those dipping sauces too, apparently. Ali shared the same, the following about her dad. My dad loved to coach his kids in sports, be it as the main coach for the team or the coach from the bleachers. You always could count on hearing from him. <laughs> when the extended family gathered Steve, um, when the extended family gathered, Steve was famous for his lollipop garden. The kids were always amazed at how the lollipop pops grew out of the ground. Religion was very important. My father and mother Marlene always made sure that JJ and I knew that we were Jewish and that we should be proud of who we are. We used to travel to different beach destinations to lead High Holy Day services. My dad was the rabbi. My mom, Marlene, was the cantor. My dad would always take the toys from our Happy Meals. He said that it was so that JJ and I wouldn't fight about it, but we all know it was so that he could play with them himself. <laughs> Allie continued, when I was older, our relationship was strained until I had kids of my own. He loved being Pop Pop and was very involved in their lives even though they lived far away. He even tutored Matthew twice a week to get him ready for his bar mitzvah, then drove to Philadelphia to perform the service as the rabbi. My father always knew how to push my buttons, especially by putting the lion sleeps tonight on repeat. Whether he came to visit us or we went to visit him and mom, mom, Molly, he would always make me my favorite breakfast of shakshuka. The last time that we saw him, he taught Maddie how to make it so that the tradition would live on. And Molly remembers their trips and how she, Allie, would, would pack a special picnic for them on their way home. Allie's husband, Steve, wrote, Steve was always my first phone call when I was having trouble dealing with, his, with my daughter. He always had a great advice on how to deal with a lot of life's issues. Steve was always good for a cigar and a glass of vodka to end the night. I will miss him dearly. Finally, his quirks. He had a plan every day which impacted what he chose to eat, what he wished to wear, with both color and brand coordination. An Adidas shirt required Adidas sweats, and so on and so forth. And his brothers would endlessly tease him about it whenever they could. Alan and Sue, longtime and loving friends, remember all of his quirks too. And Alan fondly remembers their own friendly competitions, how Steve would call himself the beast, and also resolved one day to be the bully. And when he came home that day, he marched into his house, and he confronted Molly, and he says, I think I'm going to be a bully. And Molly told him, I don't think so. And he said, OK. <laughs> Steve was also a Don Quixote kind of figure, and he always looking to make the world something a little better than how it was. In fact, he really did have a love and appreciation for the play and the character. He was always comfortable with himself, and you never had to worry about what he thought. He'd tell you before you ever asked. He was a real ham and would make Molly laugh at every turn. Like the time they took a walk, and Steve paced ahead, only to make himself repeatedly bump into a stop sign as he waited for his bride to catch up, and bump into the stop sign, and bump into the stop sign, because the stop sign said, stop. <laughs> the stories could continue for quite a while, but we are here to laugh a little bit, and to cry a little bit, um, and to recognize this larger-than-life individual, Altifrosh Min Hatzibor, never separating from the community. He taught so many lessons. He lived his life understanding that he was a role model. And he lived his life knowing that he not only should tell it like it is, he should live it like it is. That people are drawn to other people not only because of what they say, but because of who they are. They're drawn to people because others make them feel good, make them feel loved and embraced 
and unconditionally just held tight and close. And this is something that is so often preached, but not always lived. This is what he did. He drew his community closer. He made his community prouder. He lived his life out loud. He lived it with gusto. He left it all on the floor. No regrets for Steve Perry. Only lots of love left. And so today, we are here, drawing near to him, coming closer to him as he drew us closer. Molly and Allison and Stuart, we think about David and Eva, and Robbie and Matthew and Natalie and Sam and Olivia, Michael and Valerie, Jack and Francie, and all those who predeceased him some way too early. We think about them all and the legacy that they will carry on in Steve's memory. Zichron Olivracha, may his memory forever be a blessing. And let us say, Amen. Let's just pause for a moment as we consider the life Steve lived and the piece of the puzzle that he brought to our lives. If you are able, we invite you to now please rise for the chanting of El Malay Rachamim. <coughs> <coughs> Shimat <laughs> El Male Rachamim, exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the soul of Steve Perry, who has gone to his eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that our loved one find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life. May he rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. Amen. So we turn to the conclusion of our service. On behalf of the family, I know they're so, so comforted and pleased that you could be here and comfort them at this difficult juncture in their lives. The family will receive friends at 3689 Silsby Road in University Heights. They will be sitting tonight until 8 p.m. Monday and Tuesday from 1 to 4 and from 7 to 9 and then Wednesday from 1 to 4. There will be Shiva Minions tonight at 7 and then tomorrow and Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday at 7 p.m. as well.